Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really glad to have with us for the first time Harry Dent. I'm guessing that most of you probably know the name Harry Dent, probably have read, many of you have read some of his works and uh, his uh, his books that he's published in the past, but this is the first time he's been on our show, so I'm really pleased that he could be with us today. Uh, I normally don't read biographies, but Harry's is quite impressive, so let me just go through it real quickly. Uh, he is a best-selling author and one of the most outspoken financial editors in America who has developed a unique method for studying the global economies and providing insights to what to expect in the future. He received his MBA from Harvard Business School, where he was a Baker Scholar and was elected to the Century Club for his leadership excellence. He then joined Bain & Company as a Fortune 100 business consultant and now has the independent research firm Dent Research. And since then, he has spoken... Yeah, in many different medias, the mainstream media, he's been on all the major met networks, uh, and he's been featured in Barron's, Business Daily, Fortune, U.S. News, World Reports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I, I guess we, we can tell you uh, that you can gain a free copy, at least I've been told that, you can gain a free copy of Harry's uh, most recent letter, his newsletter, by going to harrydent.com, harrydent.com, and Harry can also be followed on Twitter He's active on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. So welcome, Harry. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, nice to be here, Jay. Really good to have you. Uh, you know, I, I think of you as a demographics guy. It's, I think, the first book that I read, uh, and it was some time ago, I guess in the early 90s, uh, about you as a demographic guy, and you were really painting kind of a gloom and doom picture for because of, because of demographics. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that thesis for those that might not be familiar with it, because I know that you're a cycles guy. You, you study many different cycles. I think you told me before we went live that you study everything. You like yeah. to look at the world and keep an open mind, which is why uh, you're unique, is you're not locked into any one philosophy or theory. You keep an open mind. But talk to us a little bit about, about demographics and the impact that demographics have on the markets. Yeah, well, you know, uh, because of demographics, I've been more bearish in recent years. Back in the early 90s, my first published book was The Great Boom Ahead, came out in late 1992, and I was saying, we're going to see the greatest boom in history while Japan collapses, and people say, what? No, the U.S. is collapsing, Japan's going to take over the world. No, 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 no. What I, what I found after a decade of research, and this was for my new venture in small business clients after I worked at Bain & Company, uh -huh. I was still a strategic business consultant, and you have to be able to see the trends and predict the future to be good at that. Uh -huh. So I was looking at the baby boom for my... my uh, uh, new venture clients back then, and I saw, oh my God, there's so many of these people, and I started seeing how big a wave they were, and then, then researching what they did and stuff, and I thought, oh my God, they're going to cause the greatest boom in history is they simply have kids, you know, grow up, earn, spend more money, get them into school and college, and, and they're going to peak. So in the early 90s and what late, late 80s, when I first discovered this, I call it the generational spending wave. I was the most bullish guy in America. I was predicting a Dow at 10,000 by 2,000 when it was two to 3,000. People were uh -huh. crazy. And don't you realize U.S. is a sunset country and Japan's going to become number one? I said, no, it's not even demographically possible to become number one for Japan. Mm -hmm. So so on and on. So that that's where I got my start. But I developed more cycles over time because what, what I do, Jay, is you know, that was a powerful cycle. I saw the whole yeah. 90s, even the tech wreck and, and, and the housing bubble, all this sort of stuff. But... But as time went on, like like with 9-11, when that happened, all of a sudden, um, the second bu bubble, I was predicting the Dow, you know, after going, you know, from 14,000 down to whatever, four or 5,000, it would go to, you know, 32,000, another bubble, and, and it didn't go up but half as fast. And I'm like, what's wrong? Earnings are growing, all this stuff. And I found out, oh, there's a geopolitical cycle. I dug into that. Oh, 18 years up, 18 years down, roughly. So 9-11 was the beginning of a negative geopolitical cycle, which cuts stock valuations in half. It, if I would have predicted Dow 16,000, I'd have been almost right on the number for late 2007 peak and mm -hmm. stuff. So, so I keep adding cycles. And now my most recent is a very powerful, not just a 45-year technology cycle. Just picture steamships, railroads, automobiles, jet engines, just in one sector, exactly 45 years apart, those things peak. And every other bubble, turn, every other boom in those turns into a super bubble every 90 years, 1929, and now here we are in late 2019 with the greatest bubble in all of history, fed largely by printing money in this case, 
to mm-hmm. extend the previous bubble. So that's what I do. I look at cycles. My my expertise, Jay, is real simple. I take complex trends and, 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 and say, what is the simplest trend? There's always a dominant, simple trend. I don't care how complex any person is, any factor is, any scientific. I mean, I, I learned from climate scientists. They, they can predict cycles out hundreds of thousands of years accurately. The longer the term, the cycle, the fewer the cycles there are in that horizon, the simpler it is. But the key is, can you determine which cycles are the most important? And that's what I've spent 30, 40 years doing. So now I have four cycles that together determine whether the economy is going to boom and bust. The demographic still the most central, the dominant one, but the other ones affect. And, and, and basically all four of those cycles are pointing down between 2020 and 22. Right as we're moving into the a bubble much greater than the tech bubble that peaked in early 2000, and and all this unbelievable crazy stimulus. I mean, central banks print 17 trillion dollars, mm-hmm. uh, just throw it in the financial markets and think that's okay. You can just create something for nothing, create a a bu- You know, I think they were just trying to save the banks in 2008. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They put right. a bunch of money in, in it, and they thought, well, it'll save the banks, and then with all these reserves, they'll start lending. No, they didn't lend because everybody borrowed their ass off in the, in the bubble. Consumers, businesses, government, everybody. So what happened was they created a wealth effect by pouring all this money into financial assets, creating a financial bubble, even when in the weakest recovery in all of history. And the stock markets at, at, at the greatest highs, greatest bubble in history, this is a total disconnect. My original model, the spending wave, which predicted the whole scheme of things for decades uh, and very accurate, including we predicted the 2008 downturn 20 some years before it happened with that model and the collapse of Japan in the, in the early 90s, which nobody saw coming. Mm-hmm. And basically, it says the stock market's overvalued almost 120 percent. And that's exactly the difference between all the stock buybacks with cheap money from QE, yeah. corporation earnings per share mm-hmm. are 120% higher than their corporate profits because they've cut the float of shares mm-hmm. so much. So this is a total artificial rally, and stocks are that much overvalued, which means there is a huge crash coming. Yeah. So you, so your four, the four cycles that you're really watching, you're saying demographics are still the most dominant. There's a geopolitical one. There's what are the other two? Technology cycle, 45. Now, history, if you look over a longer period of time, since the Industrial Revolution, the technology cycle really became dominant. Since Henry Ford created the assembly line and the first generation working on that, the Bob Hope after World War II entered the, the economy, they, they made demographics the dominant cycle because all of a sudden, everyday people were making a good bit of money instead of barely scraping by. They could mm-hmm. buy houses on 30-year mortgages with the first, I mean, da 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 Yeah, the yeah. Demographics ascended. And in my fourth cycle, boom and bust, comes out of Ned Davis's classic decennial cycle, but it just failed in the last decade for the first time because it's actually driven by sunspot cycles. When it failed, I had to dig, 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 dig. Sunspot cycles have averaged over the last 120 years, that same 10-year average. But the difference is it can be 8 to 14, and, and only good scientists can predict that cycle. I don't have a chance. You know, it's mm-hmm. driven by so, gravitational forces on the sun, for crying out loud. Yeah. But they are good at that, and sunspot cycles correlate down cycles, 88% of recessions in the last 150 years, and 11 out of 11 or 100% of major financial crises. And that sunspot cycle is down into about 2021, the next two years ahead. I mean, it's, it's on its bottom where you're most likely to see a recession like 2008 and 2009. So the sunspot cycles would have predicted 2008-9. Ned Davis's clock-like cycle would have predicted 2010 to 12. And, of course, you'd have missed the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, so it's it, it's it's a little complex then, and your I guess your letters deal with that uh, with yeah. those different cycles as you're uh, as you're continuing to to research and, and learn new things. Um, if demographics are the most important and the most dominant cycle, then where are we right now in the United States? And and another question I have is we have uh, with immigration. I mean, some some people are saying, well, we're not having babies ourselves here in the U.S., but we can import people. Yes. Uh, would you comment on that, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. Import people. Man. That's exactly what we've done. I mean, the baby births peaked in 1961, and the millennial generation, after the Generation X decline, only took us back. For the first time in history, the, the new generation rising, the millennials, only took us back to where we were before. Most European countries, all East Asian countries, Japan, all of those, 
d don't even come near or, 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 or rise at all. So for the first time, we have a smaller, an equal or smaller generation. So we don't need more cars, more house in the future. And countries like Japan are shrinking. They got 8 million empty homes heading towards 15 million. Germany's already covering over uh, shopping centers and residential developments to hide the fact that they don't need, that they actually have net negative demand for homes uh -huh. and right. shopping. So this is a huge change from demographics that nobody's seeing and from our point of view it's crystal clear it's super simple so all of our cycles are, are simple now i just came back from australia they have their their spending wave unlike the u.s or europe which is worse looks like an emerging country even though it's a developed country with living standards like us in europe the reason is they have very high and high quality asian immigration and and so that's so they those asian immigrants keep them young and again they're not lower than average income in education. They're higher than average coming from Asia, the best uh -huh. kind of work ethic in, in, in the world today. So, so you can see, it. yes, the solution for aging developed countries, which like Japan are just going to otherwise slow forever. And Japan's been down for 30 years, by the way, since their peak in yeah. 1996 in demographics, um, is to fight for the best immigrants around the world. And here we are trying to turn them away now. And then yeah. we've always turned away the highest education, say, oh, we got to put a quota on MBAs and PhDs. Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a, a counterintuitive. I, I guess it's, uh, it's politics. So I, let me ask you then, Harry, um, I guess what you're telling me is that there's a way to know where the demographics are and you can invest accordingly. So I guess maybe you're more bullish on Australia and some things going on there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, they, they've got a huge – I study bubbles, too, because bubbles have been a big theme. Our, our demographics also break over two generations into a four-season, two-boom and bust economy, spring boom, inflationary recession, summer, uh, in, in a, a, a bubble fall boom, and then a deflationary, deleveraging winter season. Mm -hmm. uh, this is now coming every two generations. So we went in the winter season in 2008, but this massive stimulus – has created a weak recovery and an even larger stock bubble because it's so massive. Every um, generation cycle I've studied back a hundred and some years when there's good data has had a, a final lesser bubble in the winter season because governments do stimulate when the bubbles burst. But this uh -huh. one is super stimulation. So for the first time, we have a higher bubble than we had at the peak of the fall season in 2007. So we saw that downturn coming. Governments have, have printed mass amounts of money. Now we've got an even bigger bubble, and this confluence of four cycles tell me it's going to go down. Now, now Australia, but, but bubbles everywhere, real estate, stocks, mm -hmm. commodities already burst. I always say when bubbles burst, Jay, it's not 30%, 40%, 50%, even like normal generational downturns like the 70s for the Bob Hope generation. It's 70 80 90% for stocks. It's 80 90% for commodities. It's 30 40 50% for real estate. It's much bigger. And people say, Harry, that can't happen. And the government's like, that. commodities have already collapsed 70% at worst and are going to end up being down 80% or more before this is over. My model says stocks have to go down about 80, maybe 90% to get wow. down to rally. Total financial assets and net worth of Americans has to go down 50% when you combine bonds, real estate, stocks, everything. 50%. That's $61 trillion out of $123 trillion in net financial assets in this country, in the private sector only. That's how much money could disappear from a bubble bursting. So that's what happens in the winter season. Mm -hmm. Debt bubbles deleverage, debt's written down. That, that, that causes money to disappear, created by banks. Financial bubbles, created by financial speculation, and now QE going directly in it. Those bubbles burst, money disappears again, and all of a sudden... All prices, you know, financial assets, consumer prices reset back down to reality, and then the economy's lean and mean with a lot less debt and, and a lot of less unproductive banks and companies, and then it booms. I mean, we came screaming out of the mm -hmm. 32 bottom in stocks and the 33 bottom in real estate and the economy and the highest unemployment. Screaming out. We didn't come screaming out this time because we didn't deleverage the debt. Right. Japan, again, 30 years after their peak. Never has real estate bounced there, and their economies only come out feebly, and that's because of a millennial generation, which, by the way, by our demographics, is going to peak next year and decline even further than the first decline. Oh, my God. Japan is dying before our eyes, so we can predict mm -hmm. that. Any mm -hmm. country in the world, the growth, real quick, aging sectors, 
like nursing homes, the best in the U.S. and developed countries. And in global, when I when I look at urbanization and productivity from that, another very predictable trend over time. Uh, India and Southeast Asia are going to be the big growth regions of the world coming out of this. China has greatly overbuilt, and their demographics peaked. The first emerging country, Japan was the first to peak in 1996, and then all developed countries followed uh, down to South Korea peaking now, the last. And in the emerging world, China is the first to peak, and it'll take many, many decades to get all the way around to uh, Africa. But we can predict all these trends. And, right. and so China has overbuilt it will take longer to recover, and their demographics will be working against them as they continue to urbanize. So Southeast Asia and India, man, that, that's going to be the roaring the growth. Okay. Next yeah. All right, Harry, well, let me ask you. So, if, I mean, 80, 90 percent in the equity market in the U.S., if I heard you right, and that's, that would take us to where we were in 1929, 1930. 1929 was like a 90, almost 90 percent on the Dow. Well, well, it'd be as big a percentage decrease, but it wouldn't take it. Yeah. It would take the Dow from 30 to 33,000. Uh, 30,000, maybe 33,000 at most here, near term, down to about 5,000. That'd be about an 85. That would just, I mean, that's on, I mean, that is, uh, people cannot fathom that right now in America. So let me ask you, what are you doing? What are you telling your, uh, your subscribers? I, I know you, I know you don't like gold. You're bearish on gold and commodities in general. So you're telling your subscribers that they should be aware of these these changes globally. So if you can invest globally, I guess you're going to go to ultimately to India, to Southeast Asia, maybe Australia, some other places. Is that your strategy? Well, okay. There's, there's, there's two steps here. you got to escape the bubble first. And this, this is going to be a global yeah. crash. There's bubbles everywhere. Even India with, right. the, with new highs in their markets and the strength they have, they're going to go down to everything's overvalued. So – for that, that you get out of risky assets, whether it be real estate or stocks, where the commodities have already, you know, burst mostly, and yeah. you get into the high quality bonds in the 1930s, especially the crash, 29 to 32, um, AAA corporates and and long term treasury bonds doubled in value with their yield and everything in the 30s, while everything else reset, deleveraged, and went down everything, you know, from 30% in real estate to 90% in stocks. So you get out, and you can also be in things like a part, like a cash flow positive rental real estate, apartment REITs, or medical um, Mm -hmm. uh, facility REITs, because those hold up well in downturns, and they also give you a return like the dividends, on, like the interest on those bonds to replace mm-hmm. your dividends on stock. So you do that for the downturn. You not only preserve your capital at the top of the bubble like Joseph Kennedy did in 1990, mm-hmm. then you turn around, and my target right now with my cycles around late 2022, we'll see when we get there, but early 2023, you start buying the best equity sectors, which will be aging sectors like nursing homes, just one example in the U.S. Cruise ships still be booming for older people like that after they've been beat down with everything else. Most of all, you go in India and Southeast Asia. They're going to lead us out of this, and that's when you buy gold. The next commodity bubble, commodities are a 30-year cycle, and those peaked in 2008 for most commodities, 2011 for gold, silver, and the metals. Those will turn around around that time. I think emerging countries, because of their better demographics, um, and the commodities will lead us out of this boom, because emerging countries are the greatest consumers of commodities. Right. So those come out first, and then certain developed countries. I'd also buy Australia. So Southeast Asia and India there, uh, gold, silver, uh, metals, energy are, are the best booming commodities because they're not as expandable as agriculture and, and, and beef and, you know, pigs and stuff like that. So, so yeah, we got a whole scheme for how you survive the downturn, which is totally opposite from how you then play the next what we call spring boom, a low inflation and a lower growth boom than we saw from 1983 to 2007. But in the right sectors, again, aging sectors in developed countries, because the baby boom is still going to be cooking in a lot of sectors, and Asia, especially Southeast Asia and India, that's where you're going to get the best bang for the buck. Mm-hmm. Africa's going to grow crazy too, but it's very risky, still corrupt, and I, I'd rather focus on Asia and wait till Africa matures more. So All it's right. a simple strategy. 
All right, Harry, this is a very fascinating strategy, uh, certainly a little different than what we mostly, we have a lot of gold bugs on this show. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, it's, but it's good to hear your side. It's a very interesting uh, strategy, and it makes a lot of sense to me. I want to thank you so much for spending your time with us, and let me tell our listeners again, it's harrydent.com, harrydent.com, and I understand, Harry, you'll send along a free copy so people can sample your work. Is that right? Well, actually, this is a daily newsletter that's free Uh to let people get to know us. And then we have a whole layer of newsletters once people get to know us. Okay. They like us. They can trade up. But yeah, it's a, it's it's more than just one free sample. It's a daily. You're going to be getting daily stuff from me and my partner. Okay. Russ. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Harry. It's a pleasure talking to you and meeting you for the first time. Thank you yeah, very much. Thank you, Jeff. 